So, Malika, ma'am, we are live. Can start? Thank you so much. Yeah. Mamta, you're good to go. Sir, uh, just before that, uh, sir, we are going to all uh, mute ourselves and uh, switch off our videos. Now, Mamta is going to take over and uh, then she'll transfer the Zoom link to Zoom call to you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Miranda House and Ramanujan College welcomes you all to the day 13 of the refresher course in life sciences. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Professor Suman Kundu. Professor Suman Kundu is currently Professor, Department of Biochemistry and Director, University of Delhi South Campus. He is also the director's Center for Canadian Studies. He completed his PhD from Banaras Hindu University. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Department of Biochemistry, Biophysics and Molecular Biology, Iowa State University, USA from 2000 to 2004 and worked as a research associate at Pioneer Hybrid DuPont, USA. He worked as a lecturer at School of Biotechnology, Banaras Hindu University for a year before joining University of Delhi as a reader, where he was subsequently promoted to Associate Professor in 2019 and Professor in 2012. He has successfully undertaken several administrative responsibilities, such as Pro Vice Chancellor, Dean of Colleges, Registrar, Dean Faculty of Interdisciplinary and Applied Sciences, and Head of the Department of Biochemistry. Professor Suman Kundu has served on several academic committees in various institutes across India. He is life member of Indian Academy of Biomedical Sciences, Academy of Cardiovascular Sciences, Society of Biological Chemist at Indian Biophysical Society. He is also member International Society of Hypertension, United Kingdom, Executive Council member of Proteomics Society of India and early career member Biophysical Society, USA. He has been honored with SP Tyagi Foundation Award in 2000 17 and Indo US Research <laughs> Fellowship in 2010. Recently, Sir has been inducted as the Fellow of Indian Academy of Biomedical Sciences. Sir has published more than 79 research papers, authored three books, chapters, and filed six patents. He is the founder, editor chief uh, of Journal of Proteins and Proteomics. He is recipient of multiple grants from several funding agencies. He has guided several <coughs> PhD, MPhil, M MSc students for research. Sir has delivered numerous talks in India and abroad. His research interests include structural, structure function stability relationship in blood substitutes, diagnosis of uh, hemoglo hemoglobin, ethics and drug discovery against cardiovascular and sickle cell diseases. Sir, uh, I would not stand between you and audience and uh, hand over my e-mic to you. Over to you, sir. Zoom is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sati, for that long introduction. <clears throat> Hope I am edible to, uh, audible to you all. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, thank uh, Dr. Mallika as well for being so persistent with me to deliver the lecture today. As we have heard, you know, I have been into heavy administration for long. Uh, could not do much of science in the last two years, but Dr. Mallika, you know, wanted me to speak, so I am here. Okay. Uh, as the title goes, and a good morning to <clears throat> all the participants. Uh, I, I hope uh, they're all teachers here uh, in the two weeks uh, refresher program. Uh, as the title suggests, I will 
talk about a class of proteins uh, named hemoglobins. Uh, to me, you know, nothing signifies the rich cultural heritage of our monuments in our motherland more than the imposing red fort. You know, in the world of proteins, you know, nothing is more imposing as the red colored protein we all know as hemoglobin. It's, it's, it's a fascinating protein. We all know that it's very important to life itself because it transports oxygen you know, from the lungs uh, to the tissues and brings back, brings back carbon dioxide to the lungs to be expelled. Uh, the red, colors, red color of the protein comes from a heme group you know, which is a cofactor, a prosthetic group present inside the protein. What I'm going to do today is uh, tell you new developments in the field of hemoglobin. This is uh, a textbook molecule, right? It's, it's, it's uh, very well studied at the undergraduate as well as postgraduate level. So one would wonder what is new uh, for me to talk to you about. But I thought this is a refresher program and uh, where you update your knowledge in a specific field. So this is an area where um, you, you can, you can uh, know about uh, the new developments, which are constantly pushing the boundary, busting a lot of myths, changing concepts about the protein itself. And uh, I, 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 I wish to impress upon you at the end of the talk, that these are very important molecules which needs to be studied more and more in uh, more details. Okay, and you all know Linus Pauling, one of the finest biochemists, you know, uh, who uh, not who won not one but two Nobel prizes, one for his work uh, with peptides, talking about uh, secondary structures of peptides, and the second was a Peace Prize. Pauling at one point of time had said that hemoglobin is in some ways the most interesting of all substance. And I do believe in the same. One major area of research in my lab is working with hemoglobins and I'll tell you why. And it has been <clears throat> part of folklore and part of designs, installations. You know, if you go to the US, you will see such structures on the streets even where this <clears throat> brown colored molecule represents uh, the heme and the oxygen that binds to the protein. This is another reason why I wanted to talk to you about this. You know, uh, I keep telling our teachers that hemoglobin is a good protein molecule to do a lot of practical work in life sciences laboratories. And with the new ed education policy, where research is an integral part in the fourth year you know, these molecules uh, are very amenable uh, <clears throat> to work in the laboratory, especially because of their color. And you can easily demonstrate to students, you know, you know how, the, how proteins work. When you express them in E. coli, for example, bacteria will see a very red pellet because of overexpression of the protein. So you know that expression has worked well. You don't need to do anything. Visibly, you can see. And you can grow them in kilograms, you know, I have used very large fermenters to make kilograms of red proteins, which can be stored in the freezer for years and can be worked on at any point of time that you need. Once you lyse the cells, you'll see a very red protein, so you know where your protein is. If you do column chromatography, you see your protein running over the column, so it's, it's very easy to <clears throat> demonstrate the principles of column chromatography to students as well. If you crystallize, you'll see a red colored crystal. So that's the reason I call this class of proteins uh, the red gold mine. You know. uh, I don't need to talk about this much because you all know uh, their, what their function is, oxygen transport and storage, okay, where uh, they carry oxygen from the lungs, you know, release them to the tissues where myoglobin takes them up and then <clears throat> Hemoglobin carries oxygen, carbon dioxide back to the lungs where it is expelled. I just want to draw your attention to the simple chemical reaction that hemoglobin does. 
binds to oxygen in a reversible reaction forming oxyhemoglobin which can also dissociate back into hemoglobin and oxygen this is a constant uh, you know dynamic equilibrium okay and the rate of reaction between hemoglobin and oxygen is signified by the on rate or sometimes called the association rate and the dissociation of oxyhemoglobin back to hemoglobin and oxygen is often called the off rate or dissociation rate these terms will be used in my talk so i thought i'll just tell you about them this is also textbook knowledge you know this is taken from this textbook by dickerson and guys hemoglobin consists of two parts as you know a polypeptide which is called the apoglobin and the heme prostatic group and uh, the structure of heme is shown in details here with iron at the center uh, and you have uh, the pyrrole rings four nitrogen you know satisfy <coughs> the coordination state of iron okay, which can be both in the ferric state and the ferrous state and as you know oxygen binds in the ferrous state okay and this combines with the apoglobin to form uh, the hemoglobin or hemoglobin which is red in color because of the interaction of the heme with amino acid side chains in the protein right this is a classical uh, picture a three dimensional structure for uh, hemoglobin okay it's an all alpha helical protein so there are no beta sheets in, as secondary structures the only kind of alpha helices that you see in hemoglobins are alpha helices usually you know uh, there are eight alpha helices you know and they are numbered a to h starting from the n terminus so this is a helix b helix right c helix it comes back see here c helix folds here d helix e helix folds back a helix g and h helix and h helix is the red one Okay, so a to h usually there are eight helices and <clears throat> they have pockets here on the top of the heme and the bottom of the heme which are called active site pockets heme is more or less a planar molecule and gaseous molecules like oxygen carbon monoxide nitric oxide can bind heme and hemoglobin has learned to discriminate oxygen so it binds oxygen better Uh, then then carbon monoxide and uh, nitric oxide under physiological conditions though normally hemoglobin has a very high affinity for carbon monoxide as well which results in carbon monoxide poisoning and stuff uh, but this is what uh, is a classical picture this is a uh, um, uh, macroscopic view of the active site as i said this is the iron in the heme okay you have one classically you have one histidine okay, which covalently binds to the iron this is the only covalent linkage between him and the peptide okay there is this peptide this histidine is called f8 because usually this is the eighth residue on the f helix and then on the top of it you know you have uh, this is called the proximal side of the pocket this is called the distal side of the pocket classically you have another histidine which is the seventh residue on the e helix okay and it forms uh, you know there is a water molecule here in the pocket and when there is no oxygen bound this histidine hydrogen bonds with this water molecule okay this is classically known this is all established textbook knowledge okay and the molecules that we know in the hemoglobin superfamily one is the hemoglobin the iron containing oxygen transport protein in the red blood cells of uh, vertebrates and another is myoglobin which is uh, and uh, which is a monomeric cousin of hemoglobin hemoglobin is tetramer it also it's important for storage found in muscle tissues uh, muscle tissues is all uh, red in color because there are millimolar concentrations of myoglobin that is expressed here and this kind of proteins are called classical hemoglobins or traditional hemoglobins they are textbook knowledge okay hemoglobin and myoglobin have also been important historically okay because of uh, you know they because of various landmarks okay they were the first protein myoglobin was the first protein for which three dimensional extra structure was determined so its three dimensional structure was determined 
for myoglobin is the first protein. The first protein to have its mass accurately measured, first protein to be studied by ultracentrifugation, first protein to be associated with the physiological condition, especially a pathogenic condition, sickle cell, first protein to show that a point mutation can cause problem, that is uh, anemic cell, sickle cell hemoglobin. And uh, uh, also, uh, 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 sorry, uh, cooperativity, the theories of cooperativity, how ligand binding, uh, you know, first the phenomenon of cooperativity actually was studied with hemoglobins. There are classical hemoglobins elsewhere other than uh, red blood cells okay, and uh, the tissues that we talked about. Plants at one point, you know, uh, in the early 1900s and 1930 or so, uh, plant hemoglobins were discovered especially in the soybean root system, for example, where root nodules are formed. Okay. And uh, when, when uh, hemoglobin is expressed, when they are infected by rhizobia, you, know, you see that uh, the protein is expressed in very high quantities, millimolar quantities. This is a cross section of a root nodule showing that uh, hemoglobin is expressed in very high con concentration. Their function is also transport and storage in plants. So the hemoglobins were at one point thought to be found in limited organisms, some plants like this and maybe vertebrates. However, what is important, what made hemoglobin so popular were <clears throat> over the years, it was found that they are ubiquitously present across all life forms, archaea, okay, bacteria, eukaryotes, all life forms. And these discoveries were specially made due to extensive genome mining, okay, uh, where putative hemoglobins were identified. You know, this is a little bit of an old data, uh, which shows that uh, that uh, 2,200 uh, bacterial, 140 archaeal, and 67 eukaryotic gene uh, genomes were uh, uh, identified. Okay, and um, uh, there are different, different, various kinds of hemoglobin uh, that were identified as well. As you can see, they could be uh, only hemoglobin domains as the classical ones that we talked about, or they could be associated, hybrid domains associated with other kinds of domains I'll talk about in a minute. So this is what, you know, made hemoglobins, you know, so interesting. At one point of time, it was thought that we know everything that we ought to know, you know, their function, we know their physiological importance, uh, and it's textbook knowledge. But with such discovery, it was realized that hemoglobins must have been more important in evolution that they are present in all kinds of organisms. You can name any organism today, and hemoglobins are present there. Okay. Uh, that is that made, made uh, things uh, very important for us. Just to name a few. Okay, and also ones that we have work, uh, worked upon, for example, an algae, you know, Chlamydomonas hemoglobin, just found in rice. It was found in the cyanobacterium named Cynocystis in Drosophila, in Lishmania, which causes Lishmaniasis, Kala Azar, in Arabidopsis, yeah. and in humans also. In addition to hemoglobin and myoglobin, one hemoglobin, one new hemoglobin was discovered which, which are localized in the brain and in the retina, you know, associated with neurons, it was called neuroglobin. And when neuroglobin was discovered, this was a nature paper, you know, people got more interested that all this while we knew only about uh, RBC hemoglobins and myoglobin, and yet there is another hemoglobin in humans which is called neuroglobin. So all this came into light and we worked on all of them, okay, but we made specific discoveries for these two in the lab, clammy hemoglobin and Lishmani hemoglobin, when it was not known to anyone. Okay. And these hemoglobins uh, differed from the classical, we call them new hemoglobins or sometimes novel hemoglobins, which are very different from the classical hemoglobin in their ubiquity, as I told you, they are ubiquitous. 
multiplicity. They are found in multiple numbers. I'll just show you examples. They varied in their sequence quite a bit. Sometimes you end up finding only 10 to 15 percent sequence sim uh, similarity with the classical hemoglobins. The amino acid length also varied. Usually, classically, hemoglobins are contain one, approximately 150 amino acids, but shorter and longer hemoglobins were discovered. They had a lot of, lot of conformational plasticity in their structure, which I'll show as an example, active site diversity, their kinetics, that is ligand binding also were different. They differed in their stability or cellular localization and function, there are a lot of functions that are talked about Okay, in some cases, they have shown to not to be transport or oxygen proteins, but have various other functions, which I'll also talk to about the questions where do they have common functions? Do they have multiple diverse functions? That's what makes them so interesting. Okay, So if I compare to cricket, which is a religion in the country, you know, the classical hemoglobins would be like uh, uh, class, uh, you know, test cricket, right? And when these new hemoglobins or novel hemoglobins were discovered, they were like one day cricket, a new form, you know, which is much more exciting when it was first um, uh, innovated. One example, as I said, that we had uh, discovered in our lab, sometimes back is in uh, Ishmania, and uh, from genome mining, and you see uh, that we did a modeling for the protein, it, it folded into alpha helices, typical of a hemoglobin. It had heme, but very interestingly, immediate difference what we observe, observe, as I told you that classical hemoglobins have a histidine at the bottom and the histidine at the top, but this protein had a leucine at the top, okay? which was, uh, we don't know uh, why. Usually you have a histidine, but this one had a leucine uh, in, the, in, the, in the pocket. At this position, okay, which is very interesting. But before we could uh, do more work, work on it, as it always happens, science is very competitive. Uh, this protein was reported by someone else, but I'm happy that it was reported from India, you know, in Kolkata. You know, they published this paper before we could do, and they showed that it acts as an oxygen sensor, not really an oxygen transport or storage protein but as an oxygen sen sensor, which triggers adenylate cyclase and you know, helps in a lot of, has regulatory role and prevents cell death during hypoxia. So we did not do much with it. Later on, we discovered hemoglobins in <clears throat> a green algae called chlamydomonas. And as I told you, what we immediately noticed by mining the genome was that uh, they were present in multiples. These chlamydomonas, you know, it, we found that there are 12 globins, you know, in this protein. There are 12 globins, and they are different kinds. Some, some consists of the globin like uh, domains, uh, other will con con consist of one globin domain, and there are other parts of the molecule. Some of them do, did not match to any known protein. Okay, so they, these are kind of hybrid uh, molecules. Okay. With, with other uh, other domains as well. And this continued. We did not discover this, but other scientists discovered that C. elegans, which is model nematode, as you, as you might all know, it's a model organism, you know, which is studied because many of its genes are similar to humans, has as many as 33 globins. You know, that this was mind boggling to us. Okay? that they have 33 globins okay? and uh, you know, it's a microscopic organism. Drosophila, which you know is another model okay, for genetics and all kinds of studies also had five globins. And later on, I managed to form a consortium in South Campus uh, and one of a colleague from genetics department, Dr. Sujit Sarkar, you know, worked on many of these globins and published wonderful paper, papers uh, on the various functions. Now, in terms of location, classical hemoglobins, as I told you, are mostly in RBCs, in muscles, and in plants, sometimes in roots. But these new hemoglobins were found to be cytoplasmic, and there are a few reports of them being present in the nucleus as well. Okay, so when, you, when they're present in the cytoplasm, in the nucleus, they are obviously going to have 
a uh, lot of uh, diverse functions in addition uh, to oxygen transport or storage, if any. And uh, even in Chlamydomonas, we saw uh, membrane association of, of, the, of some of these globins out of these 12, some globins showed membrane association as well, which was completely new knowledge, not known in the textbook. Okay. In terms of their oligomeric state, you know, classical hemoglobins are either monomer like myoglobin or they are tetramer, right? Four polypeptide subunits like in the hemoglobin. And in some cases in ART1 and others, they were found to have as many as 22 subunits with complex molecules, okay? But most of these new globins or novel globins were either monomer or dimer. We did not see any higher order oligomer. Okay, mostly monomer and some of them are dimer. You know, protein folds okay, and protein folding is very important for its function. Classically, if you open up any textbook, you will see that hemoglobins have a very typical fold, which is called three on three alpha helical globin fold, which means that out of the eight helices that I talked to you about, three helices are in one plane, okay, as shown here, this A helix, uh, E helix and F helix, okay, they are in one plane, while B, G and H are in another plane, okay. So they, they form this sand shown here. That's why sometimes they're also sandwich being fold. Now in this, it's very interestingly, okay, it was found that uh, they are two on two uh, helical globin fold. So instead of three, now you have two helices, the B helix and the E helix and G helix and the H helix, which formed two planes and the heme was in between those two planes. So this was called a two on two alpha helical globin fold, very different from the three on three alpha helical globin fold. And in some cases in the new hemoglobins, some helices like uh, were often not there, they were also uh, deleted. Okay, so this is, uh, this is how they differed. Okay. As I talked to you about the active site, I showed in Lishmania, there is a leucine which is already different. A very interesting observation was also found you know, in, in some of these new hemoglobins. If you look at uh, the active site, okay, uh, in and around the heme pocket, okay, you see for the classical hemoglobins, okay, uh, as I told you, you have one histidine, which is covalently linked to iron, and you have another histidine, which is not linked to iron, but it, it is there and it, when oxygen binds, it forms a hydrogen bond to oxygen and stabilizes the oxygen here. That's the role of this histidine. Okay? Uh, and that's how oxygen binds here. So this histidine is very important for that purpose. Okay? And as I told you that we have an iron at the center of the heme molecule. And as you know, iron is six coordinated. And I showed you the structure of heme. Uh, four nitrogen satisfy its coordination. And uh, one of them, the fifth one, is covalently bonded uh, to a histidine through nitrogen. So the sixth one is open for ligands to bind. Then it satisfied the sixth coordination chemistry of iron. In these new classes, okay, the novel hemoglobins, the new hemoglobins that we found, you know, we were surprised to see that this is hexa-coordinated, okay, just like cytochromes or T450s. Histidine from the bottom, histidine from the top, both are covalently linked to iron. Okay, these classes of hemoglobins were called as hexa coordinated hemoglobin. Okay, so this came as much of a surprise, you know, very uh, interesting, you know, and intriguing. And uh, just as I talked about cricket, so we ended up discovering 2020, you know, from going from classical test cricket to 50-50 now, 2020, so new information, okay. This type of hemoglobins were called hexa-coordinated. You can always ask me that how do we distinguish, you know, very easily, if I give you a hemoglobin, whether it's penta-coordinated and hexa-coordinated, it's very easy to do using spectroscopy. For example, simple absorbance spectroscopy. A penta-coordinate hemoglobin will give uh, this is the typical absorbance spectroscopy. If you measure absorbance in the visible region, you will see a peak here called the Sore peak. 
and peak in the visible region here around 50, and there's a single peak here. If you do another form of spectroscopy, which is called EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance, where you study the properties of electrons in a very high magnetic field, it will this, give this sort of spectrum. <clears throat> when you have a hexa-coordinated protein, we immediately saw that there is a difference here. Instead of a single peak, you get two peaks here because of the strong covalent binding. And the EPR spectrum is very, very different from a pentacoordinated protein. Now, whether it is because of this coordination, how do you very verify in life sciences? You know, there is one technique called uh, mutation and analysis. You do a site directed mutagenesis. So we mutated hysterine to something else, to, to a site chain which doesn't, uh, which is not hysterine. So it cannot bind to uh, iron, for example, leucine. And we saw that this spectrum and this spectrum goes back to this spectrum. Okay, for example, this is E7L rice hemoglobin where histidine is mutated to leucine. And now you lose these two peaks, you get back one peak and the EPR spectrum also becomes like pentacoordinated protein, okay, which clearly uh, proves this. Now, when we studied cyanobacterium protein, okay, I crystallized this protein and saw the crystal structure as well. We saw that it is indeed uh, uh, indeed, a hexacoordinated protein, you have one histidine at the bottom, one histidine at the top. In addition, what came as an absolute surprise for us, we saw a third histidine, okay, which binds to uh, an opropionate group here, uh, you know, a vinyl group here, sorry, in the heme, uh, forms a covalent linkage. So, so there were three histidine linkages in this uh, hemoglobin from cyanobacteria, uh, called the synecocystis species. So this hemoglobin is called synecocystis hemoglobin. And this was an absolute surprise, okay? So you end up, you know, uh, uh, watching uh, 10 overs cricket now rather than 20 overs cricket. It is so interesting and so intriguing. Okay? There are three histidines. And naturally this protein was found to be very, very stable. You know, I have studied stability of these proteins, published papers. It's very interesting. You go to pH2, you use guanine and hydrochloride, urea, high temperature, you cannot get the heme out of this protein. For classical hemoglobins, heme can easily be taken out from the protein. But for this protein, protein you cannot because of three histidine link. This is an absolutely new knowledge, not there in textbook chemistry. What about uh, various habitats? Okay, uh, for example, you know, extreme files. So we looked for the same, okay, <clears throat> and we found one hemoglobin. We have not published this yet uh, from uh, thermoacidophilic, you know, red algae, which grows in thermophilic and kind of an acidic environment. You know, it's called this, this algae is called Galdiraria sulfuraria, and we found this hemoglobin in, in, this, in this organism with typical fold and uh, you know, uh, heme also. And when we did, uh, we studied its stability. Okay. We, took the, we cloned the protein, express purified, and studied the stability. Very interestingly, we found that uh, stability, for example, 51 is much less than myoglobin, which was stable up to 77, or the green algae, you know. So the, this protein, this hemoglobin from a thermophilic organism was less stable than mesophilic hemoglobin. We still did not, do not know why. We have done a lot of studies um, uh, and a lot of analysis, but still we don't know. There are certain structural features that we, have, we are close to. Um, being identifying, uh, you know, for example, some GG motifs and some loops, which might cause this, you know, some, uh, some hydrophilic uh, electrostatic, specific electrostatic interactions, but this came as a much of a surprise, okay? And out, as I told you that oxygen goes into the molecule, okay? And uh, usually this mechanism is very well known and sometimes is available in classical textbooks as well that uh, histidine here in the distal pocket acts as a gate and this moves away and lets oxygen, let oxygen come in and bind and then histidine will hydrogen bond to that oxygen. 
Okay, and that is shown here in a better way. Uh, this is a classical textbook knowledge. But in case of this new hemoglobins, novel hemoglobins, okay, which were sometimes shorter in length also, we call them truncated hemoglobins, they showed a very interesting characteristic feature, uh, which we call tunnels, as shown in gray here. Come in and buy this. Uh, this is uh, uh, hemoglobin from uh, mycobacterium. Okay, so this is sh shown to have uh, you know, tunnels in their in their protein, as shown here in this magenta color. They have long tunnel. Okay, uh, they have hydrophobic side chains in the tunnel, and maybe they help in migration of oxygen or or you know or storage of oxygen inside the protein molecule. These tunnels were discovered. Okay which is another you know, unique property. You have, you have heard about conformational changes. There's a lot of dynamics in hemoglobin molecule. For example, this is a deoxy hemoglobin uh, found in red blood cells, which carries, which transports oxygen. You see there are four molecules in different color because this is tetrameric. Heme is shown in red. When it binds oxygen, this is uh, this red ones here are, are the oxygen. If you see, if you toggle between this, you see, you can, hopefully you can see there is conformational change between oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. You see here, uh, this is a little puckered uh, in, in, in oxy hemoglobin. They straighten up to bind oxygen and there are small changes in the molecule. These conformational changes are known. But when we saw this new hemoglobin, for example, synecocystis hemoglobin, okay, where I told you there were three histidines, we saw remarkable conformational change, which was not seen in hemoglobin and myoglobin, especially when it binds oxygen or any other ligand. For example, this hysterine here, which is in the pocket, when ligand binds, this moves away totally. It goes here. This is a huge movement for protein. Okay? And this helix here, it totally moves away. Okay? You see, this is total displacement of this helix, and this hysterine also goes away. So such conformational change, which is maximum in these new hemoglobins, is not required for oxygen transport uh, you know, storage. So what kind of function can they do? For example, can they do lig uh, ligand sensing? Then they sense uh, the amount of oxygen, levels of oxygen in the, in, the, in the body, because later on they were found to be overexpressed during hypoxia. <laughs> So as, as you can see, I showed here the conformational changes in red and gray, you know, all this, this E10 moves here, all these residues, you know, E11 moves here, a lot of conformational change, which is unique for these proteins. Maybe it was thought that they have a role in signaling with such kind of conformational change can, you know, can do signaling. Plant, a lot of plants were found to hemoglobin. For us, we were the first, you know, from India to, solve the three-dimensional structure of a hemoglobin from Arabidopsis uh, thaliana. Arabidopsis thaliana have three classes of hemoglobins, hemoglobins one, two, and three, and we solved this structure and we found that it is a dimer, it is hexa-coordinated, okay, and uh, it has tunnel as well, okay. So this is a plant hemoglobin and also the obvious question was what roles do such tunnels play? When we compared this with literature, we found that there is one class of hemoglobin known, which are flavohemoglobins, which have a globin domain. And they have, in addition to globin domain, they have another domain, which is an FAD binding domain, and they act as nitric oxide dioxygenase. That is, they destroy nitric oxide, because nitric oxide can, can be very toxic if produced in high amounts. Okay. So they, they, they reduce nitric oxide to nitrates and protect the protein. And these flavohemoglobins also have some kind of a tunnel. So our hypothesis was that these new hemoglobins with tunnels could be functioning like flavohemoglobins and may have nitric oxide dioxygenase activity. So it will be protective in their function. Okay. We also... Um, uh, crystallized uh, truncated plant hemoglobin. Truncated means they're shorter in length. Okay, And we found that this hemoglobin have N and C terminals, which are totally disordered. They keep moving. 
okay, constantly, unlike any other any other hemoglobins. So, so we, the question is, what is their function? Maybe they use this very flexible uh, mobile N and C terminals to look for uh, to look for changes, some kind of signaling bind to other molecules. So they have other partners that they bind to and do their function, which is a possibility. Okay. Again, when we looked at, I told you about K uh, on rates and off rates. When we looked at those numbers, which is called a kinetic analysis, that is the rate of binding of ligand between the classical pentacoordinate and hexacoordinate molecule, you see the of affinity for oxygen are this, this kind of numbers for myoglobin, for human hemoglobin, okay, for the plant hemoglobin. But when we, you know, when we when you observe this, you know, hexacoordinate hemoglobin, you see the affinity is much, much higher. Okay. So they bind oxygen with much, much higher affinity. Though they have a histidine sitting in the pocket which binds uh, you know, to iron, yet they bind oxygen with higher affinity, which means that that histidine in the distal pocket moves away, okay, allows oxygen to bind. And once oxygen is bound, they bind with a very high affinity. Okay. It's such high affinity, they cannot function as uh, oxygen transport or storage protein because they need to release the oxygen also okay, uh, you know, as per the functions, classical functions of oxygen transport protein. If they bind it too tightly, they cannot do that. That's also a new finding uh, for all these kinds of hemoglobins. If you see, uh, they're very different. They're, they're, even for carbon monoxide, you know, their bindings are very, very different uh, than the classical hemoglobin. So they may not function as oxygen transport or storage protein. They may function as sensors, as scavenging molecules because they have nitric oxide diastonase function or some kind of a signal uh, transduction. Okay. In terms of, you know, you know, cooperativity, you know, that's kind of a movement that you observe in hemoglobin. You know, when ligand binds to one subunit, the second subunit binds oxygen with higher affinity and subsequently third and fourth subunit keeps on binding with higher affinity, uh, which, is, which is a function called cooperativity. And uh, this, this is the conformational change that they saw, as you can see here, between the oxy and the deoxy. Okay. But as I told you, uh, synthesis shows much more uh, much higher conformational change, much more movement in the molecule. And when their binding affinity curves uh, were observed, you know, this is again a textbook knowledge. You see a sigmoidal oxygen binding, binding curve for myoglobin, uh, sorry, a rectangular hyperbolic curve for myoglobin and a sigmoidal binding curve for human hemoglobin, right? So you have rectangular hyperbola versus a human hemoglobin. Uh, which form, which is through the sigmoidal binding curve. Okay? But when we saw and their oxygen affinity uh, usually in the range of one to 10 micromolar and their dissociation rates is one uh, second inverse and hemoglobin is present in one millimolar concentration. So this is a requirement for hemoglobins to act as oxygen transport proteins. Okay? But when you see these new proteins, okay, they showed very different kind of uh, you know, binding curves. Okay? They are uh, not either not hyperbola or sigmoidal in nature. And sometimes they have all these different kinds of phases. And as you can see here, you know, three phases instead of two phase that you see, they have very high oxygen affinity and their kinetics is very different. And uh, the amount of these proteins, you know, uh, found in organisms, you know, where in sometimes nano, uh, nanomolar or micromolar range, unlike the hemoglobins which are found in molar range. Now, to act as oxygen transport protein, the concentration of hemoglobin must be higher than dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen concentration goes as much as 262 micromolar. Hemoglobins are present in millimolar quantities, so they can bind many more oxygen molecules and help with diffusion. But the new hemoglobins were in the range of nanomolar or micromolar. So obviously, 
and their kinetics are all different. So obviously they cannot act as oxygen transport uh, you know, proteins, or maybe they add. In addition to that, they may have other functions uh, like heme binding, storage and transport as nitric oxide dioxygenase, nitric oxide sensors, uh, you know, and uh, tumor suppressor protein uh, as function was associated with them, stress response, electron trans transport, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see some of the publications here, I'm not going into detail, but cytoglobin <coughs> tumor hypoxia, again from South Campus because seven groups formed uh, a consortium to work on hemoglobins, rise phytoglobins regulate response and the low mineral nutrients and abiotic stasis, you know, in arabidopsis. arabidopsis. Mm -hmm. Or they can have some defense, you know, against, you know, you know a pathogen attack, which were all done in, you know, drosophila is required for development and oxid uh, oxidative stress response, okay? So they have all these properties which we published. So these are totally new, knowledge about hemoglobins and I'm sure you'll find them very interesting and intriguing and even a lot of bioinformatics study in computer studies can be done with these proteins looking at their genomes and mining the genomes and looking and modeling the proteins etc. To end this we talked about new aspects of hemoglobins. Uh, to end the talk today is what else can you do? You know, why to study hemoglobins other than those uh, you know, interesting properties that we talked about is they can have various, uh, you know, other applications. A lot of translational research can be done. When I was in the U.S., you know, a cosmetic company you know, contacted us and we made hemoglobins in liters, you know, several, several hundred liters, you know. Uh, because they wanted to try them in cosmetics, especially the plant hemoglobin from legumes called leg hemoglobin, because they have a large pocket and they can scavenge a lot of free radicals in the skin. So the skin can get rejuvenated. That was their idea, their concept. If they use hemoglobin in, in, in a personal care product, you know, like moisturizers and creams, and they... Uh, they, they, I have not followed up that now, but they have been purchasing and doing a lot of studies on skin models, etc. Okay, they can be useful as carbon monoxide and nitric oxide sensor, sensors and also as blood substitutes. Okay, as I said, I, we made so much hemoglobin for this company. You know. And they have uh, importance for sickle cell anemia, which I call that's a totally different project I'm working on. I'll not talk about today. You know, as you know, with this mutation present at this sixth position in beta hemoglobins, you know, beta chain, you know, you end up getting uh, sickle cell hemoglobins, which do not transport oxygen well, and they cause a lot of pain and a lot of suffering for patients you know, sickle cell anemia. We also discovered, as I said, that the hemoglobin in the brain, which is called neuroglobin, that they form amyloids. You know, I am sure you've heard this term, and that was a new discovery for us. Amyloids are, are, are uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, fibrils or aggregates that they form within the cell. These are some TEM images that we showed. Okay, and which can have implications in neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, amyloids, as you know, so form these beta structures, you know, fibrilla, without much branching. They, they are not soluble, they're insoluble, they deposit, and they cause a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. You might have heard about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, which are caused by uh, proteins that, that aggregate. And neuroglobin was found to have this property we discovered they are found to have cytotoxicity. We used human neuroblastoma cells, did an MTT assay, and found that these proteins could be cytotoxic. Okay, they can they can destroy this. These amyloids can destroy the cells. Very interesting as, aspect that we observed, and uh, they also cause problems in channels. You know, in electric electric uh, conductance. We did this work with IIT Madras. Okay. Uh, so they may have neurodegenerative implications is what we are saying. Okay, we published this paper as well. And I'm not going to talk into details. You can use hemoglobins as blood substitutes. 
because you know blood is in short supply and you know blood is uh, supplied by transfusion which is obtained by donation you know especially for surgery battle wound etc you know we have shortage of blood all the time as you know so many blood camps are held all around but still we have shortage okay we have shortage of 40 million units every year okay and there are various reasons for shortage uh, the, uh, disadvantages of donated blood which do not work well because of shortage poor shelf life storage problem transmission of disease when you take blood from one person to another person blood type mismatch etc so one way that people think this problem can be we can get rid of i mean using substitutes blood substitutes which we call which mimic the functions of the blood only on short term four hours six hours not long term for long term you, you may need stem cell based uh, options but short terms and there are certain uh, blood substitutes that have been tried for example fluorinated hydrocarbons pfcs have been tried but what is more important for us is hemoglobin based oxygen carrier can we use hemoglobins to carry oxygen just the protein make lots of the proteins in the laboratory and use it as an as a, as, as a transport protein which is called a hemoglobin based oxygen carrier uh, we have been working with this it will have a lot of advantage no need to check blood types long shelf life free of side effects or disease transmission cheap to manufacture okay and they can be used as an alternate we are trying this uh, to solve this problem and we are not the first one in this i must tell you that there have been several labs especially in the us and elsewhere in the europe people have tried to use hemoglobin as an oxygen carrier and they have been largely successful especially when using them in cattle and animals but one problem was that whenever you use hemoglobins outside their rbcs they will release him okay when you inject them and this free him is very toxic okay and it will cause a lot of other problems okay so one problem that is not solved is can we prevent him coming out of hemoglobin so that means to improve the heme stability and when i was doing this you know that is new which we did for the first time we said let's learn from nature and i already told you about this protein from cyanobacteria called synthesis hemoglobin which had three histidines and from this protein does not release him him doesn't go out of this protein so if you can engineer this stability in hemoglobin okay that is introduce a histidine in hemoglobin so that it binds him and him is not released right so when you use that kind of hemoglobin as blood substitute then there will be no toxicity okay that is that is what we did and i'll stop here i'll not explain but we did this we used uh, myoglobin first which is a sing, uh, single chain single subunit small protein uh, we tried to do this chain this uh, him to the histidine okay and uh, you all know this i don't have to explain this uh, statement thundered by a legend of indian history give me blood i will give you freedom for us we are taking it in a different way okay we reduce or curtail the freedom uh, a little bit to get blood substitutes and we tried this i'm not going to explain the details which is not required uh, in in myoglobin and we found that in myoglobin that this uh, heme is released and it goes into the uh, if you if you take this at low ph okay the heme will be released and if you add an organic solvent heme will go into the organic solvent protein will stay in the aqueous solvent okay but when we made this new mutant okay which is i107h we found that heme stays in the water which means that it is inside the protein it is not released so we successfully engineered this did a lot of other studies to prove that yes this protein is more stable you know is the temperature also this protein is more stable and uh, we did a technique called differential scanning calorimetry which shows that synthesis that mutant uh, has uh, you know uh, higher stability okay uh, as, as shown here up to 85 degree it can be stable compared to the wild type okay and it binds oxygen also well there are these techniques called laser flash photolysis stop flow which are in my lab to measure the oxygen binding and we saw that this mutant uh, is more or less similar not much difference from wild type protein and may be useful as uh, as uh, as uh, as 
a transport protein, you know, uh, oxygen carrier. So we published this paper also, you know, and this was done in myoglobin, but you cannot use myoglobin for, uh, as an oxygen carrier, you need human hemoglobin, which we are trying. I am not showing that story today, maybe another day, but at that point when we published this, people did not understand, okay, and they started taking out a lot of news in the media, new researchers, they were of blood substitute, you know, uh, and uh, very uh, rough to be called, you know, a lot of these very interesting ones, but we did not make any khun, but as you know, sometimes in media, the understanding is not there, we are making just a protein. Anyway, so to end here, I hope I have impressed upon you that it's very important to study hemoglobins. They are significant molecules. If you still don't believe me, hemoglobin is the only protein okay, on which two movies have been made. Okay? We believe and trust in movies. In the Hollywood, two movies have been made with hemoglobin as the title, so they must be important. And no credit goes all my, to all my students who do, does this wonderful work while I do most of administration, nothing in the lab, a lot of funding agencies, and I end uh, by saying, you know, that the secret of life is to have a task, something you devote your entire life to, something you bring everything to every minute of the day for the rest of your life. And the most important thing is it must be something you cannot possibly do, a uh, challenging task. For me, it's all hemoglobins. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking a little extra time. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for such an informative, inspiring, and delightful talk. Uh, so, and uh, I must inform you that we have received a lot of compliments in the YouTube chat box as participants have joined through YouTube chat box. So, with your permission, if you have uh, time, sir, can we take, um, I mean, one or two questions? Yes, yeah, sure. It's actually, this is this kind of things are interesting to do, do in a physical mode where you can directly interact. But anyway, yeah, so. Yes, that's there. Uh, so the, the first question comes, which is coming from the participant, one of the participants, is that uh, what is the reason, in addition to small RBC size, that people with microcytic anemia always have low uh, hemoglobin in spite of taking high iron content food and even iron supplements? Uh, that's a question related to more related to physiology, I guess, uh, which I also wouldn't know as much. But you know, when you have this, um, this kind of disorders, as this is only one of them, sickle cell that mm -hmm. I talked about, you know, uh, so it tends to aggregate. Okay, so even if uh, it's produced, it tends to aggregate and go out of the solution. Okay, so you end up seeing less and less of uh, hemoglobin. Uh, you have the other condition which are called thalassemias, right? Which are genetic disorders also, where we have alpha thalassemia, beta thalassemia, where alpha and beta are not produced in enough amounts. So when they're not produced in enough amount, alpha and beta cannot come together to form the oxygen transport protein hemoglobin and then you end up seeing all uh, all sorts of problems. Thank you, sir. So even if you take iron, that may not help to, you know, help. solubilize the aggregated protein. Yes, thank you, sir. And one more question I would take, uh, keeping time constraint in mind. Uh, which biochemical modification of hemoglobin can potentially carry more oxygen to bloodstream? Which uh, chemical modification? Biochemical modification of hemoglobin can potentially carry more oxygen to bloodstream. Hmm. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, as such, uh, uh, if you talk about modifications, biochemical modifications to the protein molecule, uh, there's not much known except that hemoglobins can be acylated. Hemoglobin 1AC, which you have heard about hemoglobin, which is a marker for di diabetes, okay, where hemoglobin gets acylated over time. 
but uh, there's, there's not much of any other uh, modification reported which can increase, uh, which can help it to carry more blood. But what has been done and shown is uh, protein engineering in the sense that uh, you have, uh, in each subunit, you have 150 amino acids. And uh, you, you have a typical fold for hemoglobins, as I showed you. And we have a heme pocket. There are a lot of amino acids surrounding it there. And, and hemoglobin also shows a phenomenon called allosteric, right? So it has binding sites away from the heme binding sites where binding can affect uh, the oxygen binding. So if you make changes in amino acid side chains in the pocket or in the allosteric side chains, you can change uh, the binding of hemoglobin. So there are certain hemoglobins. And as I showed you here, the hexacoordinate hemoglobins, they bind oxygen with much higher affinity and can carry them. But as such, in physiological sense, uh, there's not not much not has been shown about its biochemical modification in physiology. Thank you, sir. So, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with this, uh, we if there are more questions, you can, you can send to me. I can take a look at them. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we will surely share you by email. Thank you. So, uh, with this, we conclude uh, the session for today. On behalf of Department of Chemistry, Miranda House, and TLC, Ramanujan College, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to Professor Suman Kondo for sparing his valuable time and sharing his vast expertise with us. And last but not least, I would like to express my gratitude to the participants for their presence we will be uploading the quiz and assignments related to the lecture on the portal. So I request you all to check the portal time to time for latest updates. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. And if sir, anyone, any again. teacher is interested in working on hemoglobins or use them for, for practicals or anything else, uh, you can contact me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so sure. much, sir. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Malika. Sorry, I probably could not do a good job because, you know, no, sir, it was such <laughs> I'm a from the Thank lab you and, so uh, you know, uh, that I didn't even get time to. No, sir, it was such a pleasure to hear you talk. And actually, we also study in chemistry hemoglobin. But yes. this was, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Can we stop the live streaming or should we just leave? Malika, ma'am, you are the host. I think you can do so. Only you can do so. So I'll just switch it off. Where is it option? Next to recording, ma'am. Next to recording.